it is a, it is a great pleasure uh, for me to welcome uh, Joshua Gans to our CBR this time to CBR webinar. And uh, Joshua Joshua is a, a professor of strategy at Rotman School of Management, and um, I mean not only that he's a, he's a very prolific author uh, of journal articles and books. I think it's 15 books right now, and a uh, new one on Bitcoin is on sorry on blockchain is is coming out. Um, Joshua's interests are wide ranging. Uh, they do center around technology, but they may go through economics of information, uh, platforms, AI, um, and like I said, blockchain. Um, I do need to say that my favorite book of Joshua is Parentonomics, uh, which I don't know where it fails in this technology uh, spectrum. Um, um, and um, on, uh, on a more personal note, uh, I would say that uh, my adventure with uh, research on Bitcoin and blockchain started when, uh, when Joshua and I were working on a paper on uh, private digital currencies. And this was 2011. And this was the first time uh, we in the world at, at large have heard about Bitcoin. And we took immediate interest in that. Uh, and I, it led to development of many subsequent papers and books by now. Um, so, uh, so it's it's a uh, it's great pleasure to uh, to have Joshua talk about his most recent uh, work in this in this area about um, Solomonic disputes and uh, front running in DeFi. So, um, uh, Joshua, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hannah, and uh, thanks for inviting me uh, today uh, to talk about this. Um, I have a I have a love hate relationship with cryptocurrency. <laughs> I, I I hate that we were, knew about it in twenty eleven and we're not billionaires now. <laughs> that, that, that I don't like. Why? Because we happen to be economists. That's where being an economist is not <laughs> it's not profitable uh, but uh I, I i continually find aspects of of this very intriguing even as we sort of struggle to find you know killer apps beyond the the cryptocurrencies themselves um and so oh, this uh this paper is is part of a series that i've been doing with uh, richard holden who's at the university of new south wales uh, who's himself written a, a book on on blockchain? Uh, we were interested in how you can use um, mechanism design more fruitfully uh, for various aspects of 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 the blockchain. Um, uh, one recent uh, thing we've thought about is using it as a way of uh, more quickly and and efficiently achieving blockchain consensus um but i'm not going to talk about that today um what i want to talk about is sort of a, a general uh view in terms of how uh mechanism design i think is going to be crucial to the safe operation of uh blockchains if they're ever going to develop into contractual uh, smart contract mechanisms and things like that because at the moment they're profoundly unsafe um in ways that that i find that the crypto community does not talk about nearly enough or actually at all um so my interest you know in terms of thinking about the economics of the blockchain and how it relates to contracting uh came from this paper with christian catalini uh that we did some years ago uh uh on the simple economics of the blockchain um and that basically uh, characterized the blockchain as being potentially very useful in reducing the costs of verification uh, and by verification we mean the ability to put uh, evidence on the blockchain that is interpretable by third parties outside of the relationship um i also wrote a a, a book chapter um uh, thinking about smart contracts and the various economics of it and i'm gonna mention a few things of that today because that's where i first got interested in the uh idea of using mechanism design to help that out uh, and then I, as I mentioned Richard uh, who's co-author co and Milani have also written on whether the blockchain can impact on contracting uh, in a recent book um, so 
you know, basically we have, have this thesis that blockchains have potential to reduce the cost of verification and that smart contracts, uh, because they're, you know, coded, uh, have the ability to encode mechanisms uh, to automate judicial processes and dispute resolution. Um, in other words, rather than having people decide these things, uh, we could have the code uh, actually implement a mechanism that results in 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 uh, a resolution of disputes. Um, why? Because the because code can get received messages from individuals, um, and thanks to the token underpinnings, it can also dole out incentives uh, back and forth. So those are the things you need to have a mechanism. The other thing you need is commitment, and uh, having code on the blockchain uh, Im itself immutable uh it, it gives you that commitment uh, as well so you know this seems like a very fruitful area uh and we're yet to see uh real developments here uh, i i can't i can't really explain why um but i'll point out where the opportunities that i think are so a few years ago i was motivated very much by this problem which was the problem of uh, international trade, people seeing stuff on Instagram or uh, on the web and, and ordering them uh, based on advertisements um, and uh, not getting what they paid for. Um, and, and, you know, it's an interesting set of things. Uh, it, it, there's no real resolution of disputes here because these are international trade and they're also, uh, you know, not large stakes purchases. So we're sort of outside the realm of the ability to efficiently apply contract law uh but you can see that if you have a basic level of distrust in international trade it, there's potentially a lot of opportunities uh being lost because of stories like this uh going on and so as it turns out and it's, this is not not widely known <laughs> outside of contract theory uh eric maskin and jean Tirole um critique the incomplete contracts uh literature uh so that's the literature that says there are some part, terms to a contract that are observable but not verifiable one thing that might be like that would be product quality um obviously uh, in these extreme cases you could you could take it up of a court if you could do so but they're not ver verifiable in the sense that it's too costly to go to a court um uh, and they uh, showed that you could apply uh, a mechanism called subgate perfect implementation to resolve what are essentially uh, holdup problems, uh, you know, with lower qualities coming in. Uh, and subgate perfect equilibrium, uh, subgate perfect implementation was studied uh, just a few years earlier uh, by uh, John Moore and Raphael Rapello. Um, who basically said that if you used staged mechanisms, uh, you can resolve uh, any sort of holdup problem. Uh, there exists a, exists a solution. And so obviously that told me, well, there must exist a solution to the holdup problem that I was worrying about in that international trade example. Um, and it turned out they did. And I'm not going to go through this in detail. Uh, it's it's discussed in my smart contracting paper if anyone's interested but basically uh if you encode a uh, dispute resolution process so you know if everybody agrees that they were happy with what the contract with what they got uh, delivered what they paid and what they received uh then there's no dispute but if one of the parties is upset or maybe both <laughs> but but more likely one uh, they can trigger a challenge stage and triggering a challenge stage is expensive uh, it automatically subjects you to costs but you might have an incentive to do so because the resolution of that uh, is better than where you currently are so but it has some costs but there might be some upside um, and so uh, it's it's very it's basically a staged uh, game with just messages being sent could easily be encoded so long as people have staked a sufficient amount of uh of tokens uh uh side by side with this contract and 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 what's interesting is that this uh, mechanism works um 
relying on the reports of individuals. So one of the issues we always have with uh, blockchains is, oh, well, the information on the blockchain is there and it's immutable. Well, how do we know it's any good? Uh, well, these mechanisms can provide incentives for the, you know, for truthful revelation to occur so that the information can be good. <laughs> um, so that seems like a good opportunity here. Um, and so you can uh, find a resolution mechanism that works for international trade, um, basically to avoid compensation, the seller sends the expected product and to avoid a fine, the buyer claims the product is as expected uh, so long as it is. Um, and the fear of losing sort of money being burnt, say to a third party, keeps everybody in line. In other words, once you've got a dispute, you're both kind of losing a bit. <laughs> so avoiding the dispute uh, is fine. And, and, and so long as the dispute works to reveal the truth, you can then construct this uh, nice little mechanism that keeps everybody in line. Practically, what this would look like is that the seller would need to put in the hold the price plus additional compensation in escrow until the mechanism is run. <laughs> so it's, it's the, 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 the seller has to stake a bit more uh, for, for some time to, to do that, which is not outside the realms of what you can do uh, on a blockchain. Um, these mechanisms, the, one critique of these stage mechanisms is that they could be just too complicated. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, can people do it? And some of the some of the ones they've devised are. But my co-author with other authors actually ran some empirical uh, experimental tests. And this is where it's really, I'm, I'm not a big fan of experimental economics, but if, if we've got a sort of ordinary contract situation that's a little more complicated, um, running an experiment to see if people can understand it and find the equilibrium you want is kind of a good idea. And so that actually worked, uh, they did. Um, and actually, uh, part of the team ended up expanding it into a paper that's now forthcoming in the JPE, uh, getting dynamic implementation to work. Uh, this paper, by the way, is 200 pages long. <laughs> I don't think all those pages went up in the JPE, but it just goes to show what you have to do these days. But what they did was they actually came up with a, an easier two-stage mechanism uh, to solve a lot of these problems. And in fact, I can, I can, can use it to come up with the, it's hard to see right now, but any, an even simpler mechanism than was in my paper, uh, to, to, to run this sort of automated, uh, contract enforcement, uh, dispute resolution process. So that's, that's cool. Um, but that, pa that paper of theirs, these simple mechanisms got us started on thinking, can we apply this more broadly to, issues associated with the blockchain, not just this contracting issue where you'd write a smart contract, but other ones. Um, and one that came across us immediately was this, uh, this, this article, um, Ethereum is a dark forest. The dark forest comes from this, it was popularized by this uh, book, the three body or the trilogy, the three body problem by Jing, Jing Lu. Um, and, um, which, I, which everybody should read because it's fantastic. Um, but, um, the idea is basically, uh, Ethereum being a dark forest is when you try to implement any of these contracts on Ethereum, there are a whole lot of bots out there that, you know, take away, so most importantly, payments, contractual payments, uh, and manage to, to hijack them. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost boggles the mind that this exists but let me try and explain what's going on this was sort of like worked out as a possibility on reddit back in 2014 <laughs> by one poster saying you know it's it's a bit odd um uh let me let me, let me see if i can explain it very clearly uh so uh, it's it's a form of front running um front running was sort of popularized by michael lewis in this uh book called flash boys uh, where you, uh, it, it happens in sort of, uh, non-crypto markets where people, uh, install, um, uh, very fast communication lines between Ch Chicago and New York, hundred million dollars of optic fiber laid down. And, uh, the idea is, is that if somebody places an order in Chicago to buy a whole lot of stuff, uh, these people can pick up that order 
see it in Chicago and race <laughs> across the line to New York to, to take advantage of the arbitrage opportunity that would arise uh, in that little gap. And, and by little gap, we're talking nanoseconds, but that's enough to get you ahead if you if you are uh, uh, have the infrastructure for it, get you ahead of normal people and cream some of the arbitrage opportunity for yourself. Um, and this this also occurs on blockchains as well. And, and this has got a lot of attention uh, when people are doing um, uh, transactions in decentralized exchanges. Uh, there's this possibility for this sort of front running. It's called arbitrage front running where somebody puts in a big order for some cryptocurrency and the, the front runners uh, try to get quickly onto the other side of that order <laughs> and capture the arbitrage opportunity that, that results from momentary uh, disequilibria. Uh -huh. And, you know, that, and, and, and moreover, uh, because priority is established by essentially a proof of work system by miners, uh, the miners can use uh, their own auction process and other things to encourage this sort of front running, which they want to do because people pay for it, but they, because they pay for priority. So it's a whole lot of thing that, that occurs on, 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 uh, Ethereum and, 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 you know, it's added up to, to, to almost over half a billion dollars in estimated sort of rents has been taken, uh, from these sorts of sorts of opportunities. Um, most of it is in this sort of arbitrage MEV. Uh, and so when, what I, well, the one I'm interested in is going to be this other one called liquidation MEV. Um, but um, I MEV meaning minor extraction value. Um, uh, the, the, uh, so people tend to think, oh, well, the arbitrage one's the big issue. Um, but to an economist eye, is if, if you've got a process that's made uh, a market unsafe, what will you see? Very few transactions in it. So just looking at what transactions actually occur doesn't give you a sense of what the lost opportunity really is. Um, so, so let me try and explain how this goes uh, in terms of uh, smart contracting. I mean, it has a relationship to market design literature and they're basically smart contracting on Ethereum and some other networks. Uh, um, maybe all of the networks actually uh, is is basically infeasible uh, because it isn't safe and, and something that Al Roth emphasized uh, for many years. Um, so so let me let me let me just quickly now describe what that front running is so that you can calibrate. Suppose I have a smart contract and I, I put up a contract uh, up that I want uh, I need somebody to do a computation. It's a sort of smart contract that easily can be coded. Uh, it's going to take resources, etc. But once you pop out the number or the thing uh, and send it to me, I'll know if you've done the work or not. Okay, so there are some things like that. Uh, this is a simple proxy for any sort of, um, I want you to do something and I want you to send the evidence to me that you've done it on the blockchain and uh, then I will pay you. So. Uh, you go and you do this stuff because this contract is going to give you like uh, 10 ether or something for it. Um, and uh, and then once you produce that evidence, you put that in a message. Uh, here's the evidence. And you uh, add to the message your wallet address and you put it out, uh, send the message out. And the idea is that that will get confirmed to the blockchain. And when it gets done, the smart contracting code will run and it will direct a payment from the from the buyer's wallet to the seller of the service. Typical blockchain mechanism. The problem is that it sets itself up for front running because what happens is that message of yours gets put into a thing called the mempool, which is a public pool of all the messages there. And then those get aggregated and collected together into blocks and then confirmed. The problem is that as soon as you put your message out there saying, here's the evidence and here's my request for payment, um, everybody can see it. And 
people have programmed bots to be able to see this structure and take the evidence and swap out their own wallet address for yours. And what's more is because the transaction fee is also public and associated with it, they can outbid you <laughs> uh, for priority by having a higher transaction fee or gas fee uh, in the case of Ethereum. Um, so by the time your contract, your message gets confirmed to the blockchain, the front runner has already drained the smart contract wallet of all the money. And so you can't get paid. Now, I mean, that's so, that is basically the idea is that you go to a restaurant, <laughs> uh, you get a bill, you leave cash to pay for the bill. And then instead of it going to the, the restaurant, somebody else swoops in and takes the cash. And suffice it to say, you can't do contracts under that sort of risk in it, uh, 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 associated with them. And some of these have, have resulted, uh, you know, like in, in millions before they sort of all disappeared because no one wanted to contract anymore uh, like that. So this was, this was, you know, this is, this is a, this is a, a, a is, I, I would say it's a textbook contracting problem, but it isn't because it's so bad, so unsafe. Uh, that, that it boggles the mind uh, that anyone thinks that this entire system can work. Anyway, and, and, and let alone there's no attention being made given to this. <laughs> Lots of attention to the arbitrage front running, no attention to this part of it. But this has to be solved if we're ever going to have smart contracting work. Um, I will pref uh, preface, you know, people have been thinking about using more cryptography to solve this problem. Um, there's a few things that that leads to issues with. The first is the two parties to the contract have to be known to each other. Uh, they have to, there has to be some other things in order to decode, uh, decode potentially. Um, also using cryptography slows everything down because everything will have to, you know, you have to encode a lot of transactions and you have to decode them in order to execute them. So we already have issues as it is on processing these things. So, so that could be a problem as well. Um, so the good news, just to preface, is that Richard and I believe we've come up with a way of amending the smart contract code that in equilibrium will resolve this problem. And that's what I want to explain to you for the rest of this talk. And it turns out that this inspiration comes from uh, earlier mechanism design issue faced by King Solomon. So for those of you who don't know, King Solomon, uh, uh, a figure from the Bible, the Old Testament, um, uh, he's, he's seen as very wise. And he's seen as very wise pretty much for this story. Um, what happened was he was asked to resolve a dispute between two women who both claim to be the mother of a baby. <laughs> um, how they came to have this uh, thing, uh, you know, there's various leads up to it, but just imagine for the moment, that's it. One of them is the true mother. One of them is the false mother. Uh, the two mothers know who they are, uh, but both of them are claiming to be the true mother and King Solomon has to resolve this. Now, King Solomon does something that looks very much like a mechanism, uh, although for, for reasons I'll explain in a minute, it has some issues. Um, what he does is he says, okay, okay, I can't tell who's the real mother. This baby could be either of yours. Who can tell? Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the baby. We're going to cut it in half. One of you can have one half, the left half. One of you can have the right half. Uh, and that'll be it. And... Uh, the rest of the story goes, the, the, the one woman, presumably the false mother, says, fine, that sounds fine, fine, let's just do that. And the true mother says, no, 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 don't cut the baby in half. She can have the whole baby. I, I don't want any harm to come to it. King Solomon then pops up and says, uh, ah, you must be the true mother, because only the true mother would, you know, put the baby's interest first. Now, that's how the story goes. It's very nice. It's so close to a mechanism uh, that it's very tantalizing. 
Um, so let me just formally uh, analyze this and we're gonna uh, we're gonna have to fix this a bit but so you've got two agents a and b there's two states of the world alpha and beta there's an ownership to dispute over something we'll call it t um if uh if if alpha is true then the a is the true mother the legitimate claimant the real owner uh if beta is true it's 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 b but let's suppose that alpha is true so we can just run the mechanism uh as if a is the as the, is the true true mother so there are three outcomes that solomon proposed he said i'm either going to allocate uh the baby to a allocate it to b or i'm going to split the baby in two that is kill the baby uh, option d we'll call it um his stated mechanism his stated mechanism is that each agent makes a claim regarding the state of the world whether they think it's alpha or beta is the true one if they both agree on alpha you choose a to be the uh, uh get the baby if both agree on beta you choose b if they disagree then you choose d okay that's his mechanism now what happened in that mechanism uh was was something different what happened the outcome of that mechanism was the was the the false mother uh said uh fine let's do d we disagree <laughs> and the true mother said no 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 I'm going to lie and I'm going to say it's beta so that it goes to the true mother rather than to the false mother rather than killing the baby um so that's not truthful revelation by the way <laughs> that was exactly the opposite um his implemented mechanism was not that actually uh it's fine on the first two steps but on the final step if they disagreed uh then he said he was going to choose d but he never was going to choose d <laughs> and if he was going to choose uh d um uh, if he was going to if he was going to allocate it to the the mother who broke the woman who broke first well then the false mother who wanted presumably wanted a whole baby not a dead one uh would also claim <laughs> to give it to the other person if they knew that that was the the trick so that's not an equilibrium outcome it's not true for revelation it's not anything so before I get to using this sort of mechanism to solve the blockchain I have to solve the 3000 year old problem that Solomon the wise did not solve so um it turns out we're not the first people to uh do this uh there's a a, a nice little literature in, ga in in game theory mechanism design that spends time doing this because they're all economists the basic idea was to say the true mother has higher value for the baby than the false mother we'll make that as an assumption and then we're going to run an auction of various kinds <laughs> to try and it'll uh, uh, uh reveal uh who, who the true who the true one is now suffice it to say King Solomon running off an auction was probably not going to get him into the the Bible story and history um um also most people would find that repugnant also it's not clear that the monetary value to the true mother is higher than the monetary value to the other uh because it's very hard to deal with cardinal preferences over things like babies so this has had not been very satisfactory and it's certainly not going to help our little situation here so what do we want we want a mechanism that actually reveals the truth we want outcomes that are credible so no threatening to kill the baby uh because that's not credible um we don't want a repugnant mechanism so no bidding for babies and we don't want agents to have we don't want to need cardinal knowledge as preferences we'd like to rank things it's just going to make our life a lot easier so here's our mechanism it's the same as Solomon's mechanism except for if you see the three outcomes there we've got an option c and option c is to take the baby and allocate it to a, another person to raise the baby a third party um but neither of the neither of the the two women who are disputing and so the simple report simultaneous report mechanism the simple version simple version of the sub game perfect equilibrium would go like this um you choose one agent called the proposer at random and the other agent becomes the responder 
if the proposer and the responder agree, then it's alpha, it goes to A. If they agree, it goes, it's beta, it goes to B. If they disagree, they both get fined um, and a challenge stage begins. Or notice it's similar to the challenge, the dispute resolution stage, uh, if there's a disagreement. In that stage where all the work is being done, you go to the proposer and you say, do you want to change your mind? If the proposer uh, uh, does change, uh, if the proposer, sorry, if the proposer um, uh, doesn't change, uh, does change their mind, uh, then the baby goes to uh, wherever their agreement was uh, and the responder is refunded the fine. Um, and depending on whether it's, alpha or beta is the truth we'll, we'll determine that if they disagree then it gets given to a third party okay so instead it doesn't get killed it gets given to a third party but you sort of get this extra challenge stage to to work this stuff out um so what are we going to be able to use to solve the equilibrium one is the legitimate claimant is one of the agents here <laughs> it's not just two random women uh the agents themselves know the truth the agents have preferences. One preference is, is their top preference is to get the baby to themselves. Makes sense. That's that's written in scripture. Uh, the true agent has distinct preferences. We have to have something different from the false one, false claimant. Um, so remember, A is the true claimant, uh, by assumption, just here to, to work through. And so the true claimant has a strict preference that the baby goes to a third party rather than the woman who's try, trying to claim the baby. Now, why do they have that? You can come up with stories for that, but maybe the story is, look, I'd rather go to any random person than this woman who's willing to lie to steal my baby, <laughs> who's known to lie. So, you know, that's a rationale for that. Um, uh, for But the other... Uh, uh, mother was even easier to write their preferences is they prefer to get the baby uh but they're indifferent between whether it goes back to the to a or whether it or it gets given to anyone else now that's consistent with what happened in the bible because that person was indifferent to that baby be getting killed so this is a, a weaker form of preference there as well so if you're willing to stomach those preferences this is going to work out uh, oh no it's final preference is people prefer not to pay a fine if paired with any outcome that's still ordinal relies on continuity of f but that's fine so in our mechanism under the stated assumption and for so long as the fine is not too large um uh uh so too large you'll you'll get truth for revelation um in the case one if the, if the, the proposer is a the true person uh if there's a dispute uh um uh the, if the if the other responder says no no I'm the true mother uh you 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 likely get to uh, you a, a could decide to do that or they could decide to hold far, firm and, and reveal the truth um if they if they if they reveal the truth uh then when this uh uh challenge stage comes in uh they're going to prefer it to go to the third party and go to the other mother so they're going to want to disagree um it could be the, the other mother doesn't the other woman doesn't care so they might come to some other resolution um so in that second stage mp equals alpha and the preferences we give give them an incentive to do that and this is the harder one is what if the proposal is the false mother um the true mother asserts their claim the false mother is is it has no option by which they end up getting the baby <laughs> so they end up with c if you if they trigger a dispute resolution they end up with c but they end up with a fine and the reason they end up that way is because the true mother will always prefer c to b and so will always have that continuing dispute there's no world in which the false mother ends up with the baby um in this instance um so um this actually resolves the matter. this works <laughs> this uh works to resolve the mechanism um uh so i want you to keep can that I, in can mind I, can i stop you for yeah. a moment and ask a question 
Sure. So, so basically, if you can go back one slide. Uh, Oops. It, yes. So uh, there is no way that the false mother gets the baby. But then yeah. if the, uh, what was the case, uh, the case when the, uh, when the baby goes to the third party, it's when the false when they dispute when they continue to have a dispute in the challenge stage yes and this happens whenever the false mother is a proposer right right okay if the false so, mother is a proposer uh well there's two things that happen there the false mother is a proposer they uh they can change their mind um uh, uh, if, if the sorry if the false part false mother is a proposer um when they get to the challenge stage, which is just up the top, I wish, oh, sorry, I'm terrible at this. Um, oops, sorry. I, I, I do love this uh, uh, Zoom, which does everything possible to stop you. So this is the part we're, we're, we're focusing on here. Mm -hmm. This is the challenge stage. So the responder has already said, no, 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 I'm the true mother, which we know to be the truth. Uh, the 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 false mother now is the proposer and says are they going to assert their claim if they assert their claim they end up with c if they don't assert their claim and they change their mind they end up with a but they are indifferent between a and c so so it's it's you know either either it goes back to the uh back to the other uh, mother or um or we end up with c in that instance so now when the false mother uh, is going to assert their claim. If the others agree, then you get B. Well, the, uh, will the others agree? Uh, no, no, that's the, their worst option. So we know that's not going to occur. <laughs> They'd rather have anything than that. Uh, will the other assert? Yes. Um, and they, in that situation, um, know they're going to end up with C. They are going to be fined, but that is better than it going to be by our assumptions here of continuity. Um, so given all this, uh, if you go for a truthful revelation, uh, uh, you, you, uh, um, the, the true mother wants to assert their claim because they'll get A, uh, the false mother is going to get a worse outcome uh, because they're going to have a fine, <laughs> which, they, uh, uh, which they find is worse than uh, A, comma, zero. So, yeah, so what I wanted to clarify is that the outcome of this mechanism is not just that the false mother never gets the baby, but that the uh, true mother always gets the baby. That's correct. I guess we, I did not want to leave the slide feeling that it would be a good mechanism if it assigns baby to a third party. Oh, no, no, no. Right. You end up, you end up with the true claimant uh, getting it. Yeah, sorry. I did, didn't emphasize yes. that. Yes. It's really, it's really cool i i this on itself is kind of was i, well, I was pretty happy with how that worked out um so, so there, let me let me let me move on um so there are there are two questions and i don't know whether you want to answer oh, those me, two questions me. about um about this this particular part so uh we'd start with the uh more straightforward one is whether we need the indifference for the preferences of the false mother um, we have a, a strict it, does, it, it does help it, it helps a little bit um uh, i think we don't necessarily need it we have it has to be distinct um but I, I i think actually no i think we do need it if they had a preference for it going to a third party rather than the other woman uh a strict preference then we'd have a problem here because remember we have to have some difference in their preferences for the mechanism to resolve <laughs> it's going to pick up something and and the interesting thing is we don't need a difference in their most preferred outcome we can have an, a, a difference uh, further down the order um again i would assert that that indifference assumption for for uh, uh uh the false 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 mother uh is consistent with the bible bit of uh, oh you can just chop up the baby <laughs> you know it's, it's consistent with that so the um, strict preference of b uh, is more preferred than c than a would be enough of a difference between the two preferences to get the 
mechanisms. Yeah, I don't no, so I don't think you I don't think you would get that because they've they've both got sort of symmetric preferences um in that regard. So to break this tie, you, you need something something stronger there. <laughs> no. I mean this is pretty minimalist compared to um the rest of the literature, but uh, as you'll see in a second, um when I get to the blockchain, it's it's much easier to stomach. <laughs> exactly. So I'm I'm also very interested in seeing how it works in in blockchain, and this is why uh, I think Gordon we will leave your question until yeah, let's, until let's, Joshua let's... talks about it in the context of blockchain. Exactly. Okay. So let's at long last we get to the the thing we wanted to talk about: blockchain front running, the liquidation front running, not the arbitrage one. I haven't solved that. Leave that to all the people who worry about that one. I'm worried about the what I regard as the bigger problem. Um, so, uh, what's the context for that so that we, uh, can calibrate? The seller puts out a contract, um, to pay T for performance E. Uh, then, uh, A performs the contract and produces E at a cost to them of C. Uh, and they send a message, uh, alpha comma E says, send it to my wallet alpha my wallet's alpha and here's the evidence that i've performed the contract and they put that on the blockchain uh they have to pay a, a fee to do that of course because there's always transaction fees and it's fa all right then that goes into the mempool and in the mempool b a bot sees that and puts in their own message with the same evidence but a different wallet address put their own wallet address and they also see the, the fee so that they can now outbid the fee to get priority on the blockchain. So when the smart contract runs, it'll run on them first. Okay. So that goes in the mempool. The miners assemble the blocks to maximize fees. So they're going to give B priority over A. And then uh, uh, they confirm message B ahead of message A. And so the end of this is that S sends the, the, the tokens to B um, and A is pissed off. <laughs> they, they've earned no profit. Uh, they've incurred the cost C and they've incurred a fee for confirming the, the block they did to the chain. So it's, it's bad. And you will see here, what if there's more people than B? Uh, then, you know, the, the fees are going to rise to cover close to t <laughs> to make this worthwhile and that means that it will it, there is no scope for a to raise their fee to make this profitable for them so this is a, this is as devastating a problem as we get in contracting so a gets this b gets this uh and equilibrium a never gets a positive payoff and the smart contract is therefore not performed they wouldn't actually enter into this environment it's too unsafe so we have to solve this, okay? One people suggested, can we encrypt stuff on the uh, on the uh, thing? Yes, we can. It's costly. Uh, might exclude certain contracts. It's not uh, that doesn't make it attractive from my perspective. Um, others say, oh, what if we have an auction, a more transparent auction for who gets to be first? Well, that's not going to help anyone here either, because the front runners are going to still squeeze A out of that, even if A can win that contract. It's going to be they're going to get have fees that are greater than the the, the 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 profits they were hoping from t minus c okay so our solution here is why don't we put in a mechanism a mechanism after the runs after the two blocks are, 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 are confirmed to the blockchain okay so how do we do that well the first thing you have to do and this happens in any front running exercise Oh, so what do we know? Just A and B both know who's legitimate and who isn't. We actually know that. <laughs> so we have that condition. Uh, the legitimate claimant is part of the pool. We have that by assumption because you can't you can't copy someone unless they're part of the pool. Um, the illegitimate claimants only care about the money. I think that's a reasonable assumption here. Uh, and suppose that the, le the true claimant has a weak preference, weak preference, that money doesn't go to illegitimate claimants. So that is, if A is the true claimant, then if B receives tokens, their payoff is negative C minus FA, while if B does not receive tokens, their payoff is theta minus C minus FA. In other words, they prefer that 
the tokens do not they have a there's some probability they pref actually explicitly prefer the tokens not to go to b and could be burnt or gone to a charity or whatever <laughs> or some something else okay um so yeah so uh, you know so one is the near ask that question i i have it could be going to a charity and you just have to make sure it's actually going to a charity and stuff like that um for the moment just think about it as being burnt <laughs> that we actually just fry the tokens um which Obviously, if that happens, it's out of, out of equilibrium action, but we're looking for equilibrium that work. So step number one in, in solving this problem is you have to discretize time. So you have to wait a certain amount of time and gather all the claims that are over a period. So, you know, if if I can't get to the confirm to the first block, um, you've got to you've got to work out at some how many blocks before you run this mechanism. Then over that block, you say, "Oh, there are all these different messages. I can't rely on their timestamps, but I I know they're there." And hopefully, and, and we said delta high enough that the uh, that A will be part of that pool <laughs> is is the important part there because they're a bit delayed. Um, Okay, so you, you'll notice the familiar with this, with with, uh, with everything, we always come up with a solution blockchain. Just wait, double spending, just wait. You know, <laughs> so it's, this is a version of that, which you have to do. But the thing is, you have that's what happens in all the things to resolve front running anywhere is uh, discretizing time because everybody's taking advantage of more continuous time. Okay, so our mechanism, it's going to be the same mechanism you just saw, just the labels have changed. We've got A and B now. Uh, A, the true claimant, B, the false one, two states of the world. They've got an ownership over T, which T is now revealed to be tokens. <laughs> okay. Uh, and we'll, we'll suppose just for our argument that A is the true claimant, uh, the legit, legitimate claimant. So there's three outcomes. The tokens go to A, the tokens go to B, or C, the tokens go to a third party or they're destroyed. Neither. Okay. So neither. The Solomonic mechanism is if during this discrete period of time there is a single message uh, from one person just in the who produces the evidence, just send the tokens to them. If during that thing there is two messages uh, and uh, or two or more messages read, but let's just do two messages for the moment, um, then uh, begin the challenge stage. And in the challenge stage, you choose one agent at random and give them the opportunity to withdraw their claim. If the claim is withdrawn, you pay the other agent T. If the claim is asserted, then you choose the, if you've still got a dispute, you choose C. Now, notice I haven't put any discussion here of fines. And you know why? I don't have to. Because we already have fees on the blockchain that are playing that role. <laughs> <laughs> so so we already have we already have the 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 fines is the premium over the fee that the legitimate claimant would pay is the is the fine and it's automatically set and interestingly enough it's kind of set by the the claimants themselves so it's that's a bit wacky um so we have here the 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 system that occurs is basically the same as before uh except you know so once you've got confirmed claimants on the blockchain you run not the smart contract gets run with a solomonic clause when there's a, a dispute uh it either gives the tokens to the legitimate person or the tokens are, are burned in that mechanism via our early earlier proof of the solomonic mechanism for the for the women um, so under the stated assumption, and so long as there is some chance that the true claimant doesn't want the front runner to get the tokens and would rather it go to the third party, which I think is easier to stomach here. Uh, and the, the illegitimate claimant couldn't care less where the tokens go if it doesn't go to them, because <laughs> all they care about is the money. Okay. So case one, A gets a withdrawal opportunity. Um, if A receives negative C minus FA, if they renounce the claim, they get a little bit more if they assert the claim because they prefer to not see it go to the, the other party. So, so they'll do that. Knowing this, B is the best they're going to do is get negative FB if they make a claim and zero otherwise. Well, if this mechanism is running, they shouldn't even try front running because they're not going to come out on top. <laughs> It's just costly for them. They'd just be paying fees. Um, and you can run through this. If B has got the withdrawal opportunity, uh, they have an incentive to, uh, 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 they're indifferent. Um, so they can, they can, uh, they can, um, 
um uh they 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 know they're not going to win so they won't even make a claim in the first place and only a will end up claiming so it's basically the same as the dispute over the mothers except the fees on the blockchain are now paying this role of the fines in the previous mechanism um so some remarks about this it works if there's more than one illegitimate claimant um you got to use a slightly more complicated mechanism with some pairwise matching but it would work two if there can be collusion amongst the illegitimate claimants you can still get this to work with an iterative mechanism because the true claimant is still in the pool you just have to there's a there's a more complicated mechanism that will discover them um if the legitimate claimant is not amongst the pool due to network congestion that's bad so you've already just got to set this delta such that you think there's been enough chance for the legitimate claimant to get to the pool now the good news may be the good news uh in a lot of these contracts it's not like it's so high frequency that you have to worry about delta that it's going to discourage contracting so you may as well set it high enough um and we've got other work we can show that this is robust to perturbations in common knowledge and uh some other things as well if if that if that, if that tickles your fancy um now interestingly enough having gone through all that work we then discovered that there's another mechanism even simpler that can resolve this and it's this it's we we skip the dispute change stage in, entirely and we call it a mutually assured destruction mechanism if there's one message sent during delta then we're all fine if there's two if you get a dispute you just burn the tokens <laughs> now why does that work it works because you can't get to a dispute without the true person so the true person will come into it now they'll be if somebody comes in and does a, a dispute well uh, uh they're only harming themselves um, so 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 in the equilibrium because of the mutually assured destruction if there are two of them the the false claimants don't enter and they and so 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 this this mechanism actually works out um now what this mechanism is not robust to is this sort of like perturbations and changes in common knowledge and stuff like that but it is kind of simple um uh in terms of how how it goes um so um okay um should I answer some of these questions now or we so we are we're down to one question because, okay uh, uh, Gordon's was was answered uh as I expected and so okay. uh Thomas is asking what if instead of an imposter imposter uh we actually have two uh people who two agents who legitimately did the work and they submitted their claims right, and then if right. they submit the claims at different slightly different times but within the same block yeah both we, of their war gets destroyed right so so the a contract where you believe that there could be two people performing it like in sort of some sort of race where you thought the probability they end up in the same same time period is is high you're right it's 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 bad for that outcome <laughs> bad for that situation right there um of course um you could check before you put your message in to claim that there's no other claimant sitting there but um, there are network latency issues i know no so there's got to be some issue yeah. there so it's it, 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 we discussed this in the, in the paper there's you know there's always some you know like basically this is saying what if we can't fully discretize time in the racing sense so these sorts of contracts there may be issues so you have to sort of think what is my ability to stomach this problem <laughs> to to do that so so you, you identified the one contract space where I think there's an issue nonetheless there's a lot of other ones here um let me just give you some words on implementation we did it <laughs> if you want to know we you can go to this uh, uh github uh the comsolomonic mechanism slash contract um we programmed uh two smart contracts onto the ethereum blockchain one of which was an ordinary one to do this computation to see if it gets front run for about a hundred dollars worth of ether uh is the is the thing for that uh number two uh was one with us uh, our solomonic mechanism installed um we put these contracts on 
and got them confirmed to the same block and we got the responses confirmed to the same block for two contracts the the one without the clause was front run hundred dollars drained instantly the other one was not <laughs> and executed now what is going on there because that was a I'll tell you that was a surprise um because the mechanism we proposed here is an equilibrium mechanism um and so what this is saying is is that the bots realized there was something up with this contract and decided not to front run it which I don't think they could have had knowledge of what was up <laughs> with it um which is very odd it means that at the moment there's a simple solution to this problem is just put something else in the contract <laughs> that looks a bit dodgy <laughs> doesn't have to be a millionaire and it can deter these people which seems surprising to me we have so the problem we face here is we can't get ethics approval to actually run a study of this to see if this contract works why because we are explicitly going to harm the front runners <laughs> we're going to induce them to incur gas fees and not get rewarded so you're not allowed to ha harm front runners even if they're bots because <laughs> those bots are owned by someone so we can't do that so i'm i'm hopeful one day some entrepreneur might <laughs> decide to go and run this and see if it can improve matters and maybe we'll get some stuff but the code is all there it's all open source and we're you know we just <laughs> want to get interest but there's not a huge interest in this problem at the moment um here's the evidence uh there's evidence and it's on the github page of, of us running these contracts um and we've got a youtube video there which uh which goes through uh, which shows you what happened um whoops okay so there is all sorts of implementation choices that come with this so just just, oh. just to clarify at the moment we're not sure whether the response that you got from the blockchain is just showing a weakness of bot design right because bots are designed to take advantage yeah. of certain type of contracts and if you add additional clauses then it doesn't fall into the category that the, that the bots are designed to take advantage of and right. that may have been the reason rather than realization the thing on the <laughs> Yeah, the thing that surprises me about that. Yeah, the thing that surprises me about that is that, uh, you know, uh, how would this be a problem if all you have to do is put a bit of random other code in there and the bots run off scared? <laughs> it seemed like the bots should be more, more aggressive than that. Um, the alternative is the bots are super sophisticated and were able to sort of see what this was. Well, you know. Uh, again I, that's not what I would have expected so I don't know how to tease that out yet we, we already lost about a thousand dollars trying to get the code right <laughs> yeah, not, not from the Solomonic con just the other contract trying <laughs> to get it right kept on losing money um anyway <laughs> that's, that's cool. um so the implementation there's some implementation choices here um you know are we going to require people to have hardcore coded responses to the challenges you know uh, the mechanism currently relies on there looks like a little dialogue going of course you could hard code those responses I think the mutually assured destruction thing gives the answer there um there's an issue by the way of doing randomization remember the mechanism relies on the proposer and the responder being randomly drawn uh we had to do some little tricks in in coding this in but there's always a problem with randomization is it exists no randomization mechanism <laughs> in computer science until we get quantum working properly um you've got to choose the time period uh that's going to depend on the contract and people's knowledge etc um where does the tokens go do you burn the tokens do you send them to a charity the one thing you don't want to do is have any suggestion you're keeping it for yourself because the one person who would want to trigger this mechanism is the person who's 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 uh who's going to pay the pay the pay the amount if it, they can have it all come back to them that's not going to work very well um uh uh it, one of the ways of signaling this as i said we we didn't uh, expect that but what you'd want to do is is it a good idea to broadcast up front hey we've got this clause in our thing or is it a good idea to keep silent on that so that it, uh, the, the 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 bots don't know if you've got it or not <laughs> in which case it could deter a bit more uh, of this behavior um and just in case you're thinking you know why is this problem here on the on the blockchain 
uh, and, and where it could could go. This is one of my favorite stories of the last few years, is that this Lithuanian man said, oh, look, Google and Facebook are really big companies. I bet you they don't know what's going on. So if I send them requests for payments for services that I never did and there's no contract for, I wonder if they'd just pay. And it turned out they did. <laughs> And he managed to get 121 million of payments out of Google and Facebook. And so you look at that and say, wow, <laughs> it's very believable. You know, if we've got this sort of problem occurring at, you know, with high tech, sophisticated companies, imagine how hard our challenges are to get the safety working on the, on the blockchain. And uh, that's it for my slides happy to take questions or, or whatever. Yeah, so let me let me open it up for questions. Uh, you know, you can type them up and then, or, or at least indicate you want to ask a question and we can unmute. Yeah, um, sure. yeah. yeah. and uh, you know, I, I, what I want to say is like, I was thinking about implementation of this, of the mechanism. I mean, mechanism uh, clearly, you know, there are a set of uh, situations where it would be optimal uh, mechanism, if, despite the caveats that we discussed, and it is nice that we can implement it at the level of uh, of a smart contract. Because what I was worried initially uh, was that maybe we need to have a systemic change at the level of the blockchain to implement it, and that would be a, a kind of a difficult thing in itself. But if we can have it at the level of uh, of smart contract, that may be very helpful. And in fact, bots can learn to actually recognize this clause in a smart contract and avoid those smart contracts. Yes. Uh, rather than just being scared by different, uh, by, by other, by un unusual things. Right, exactly. So I think, uh, you know, uh, transparency of those sorts of things really works in our favor here to get to this equilibrium where it's safer. Um, so it's, it's a different solution than, you know, like using cryptography or something like that, because it is a solution that works in equilibrium, <laughs> um, uh, rather than, rather than, uh, rather than by brute force by some means. Um, and I kind of think that's better. I mean, you, in your work with Yana's, you know, you emphasize that it's, it's much better to have a, an equilibrium, uh, uh, outcome to get sort of anything on the blockchain than it is to sort of pay up front to prevent some behavior, yeah. I mean, then we need to worry about, uh, you know, the extent to which all players are rational enough uh, to actually play the equilibrium and what would be the trembling hand outcome and whether it would be damaging. Oh. So, so that's okay. It's, uh, so that's where this sort of changes in common knowledge and uncertainty. The, the, it, so it won't surprise you that since Maskin and Tarot, um, the first thing about this was, well, this really can solve that problem. Um, where is it in the real world? Why is it in the real world? And so they did all these sort of perturbations to common knowledge and other things like that to to do that, and said, oh, it doesn't exist because you can you can do, it does not trembling hand perfect or some variant thereof. Uh, so that's why it doesn't exist in the real world. But then the simultaneous report mechanism came in the the simpler version, which doesn't have any of those problems. <laughs> so we're back to why it doesn't exist in the real world. Now, if we were if we were chemists, I mean, if you're a chemist and you win the Nobel Prize for inventing graphene uh, or you propose graphene people don't say oh, i don't know about it. that seems like a great material but it must exist out there somewhere if it's so great <laughs> but they don't say that and so we have to look at who are the people who came up with this mechanism masculine and troll let us be very clear it's not like they're at the the bottom of our profession uh they're the top end of creativity you know there's a perfectly acceptable answer why we don't see it in the real world is because until then, no geniuses came up with it. <laughs> so, so and, yeah. And, uh, and so, hence, this is another solution in the line of uh, geniuses coming up with new solutions. Right, exactly. exactly. So Bitcoin, by the way, Bitcoin didn't require any technology that was not present 10 years earlier. So it must have existed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's the difference between discovery and invention. Yeah, I know. But I'm putting this in the, I think sub-game perfect implementation was an invention. Yeah. yeah. 
So uh, I see no other questions and indications. So uh, right. with that, I want to thank you very much, uh, Joshua. That was uh, very interesting and enlightening.